Well, we are to the book of Jonah. So, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and then Jonah. And when we think about Jonah, we generally think about the big fish, right? The large fish that God sent to uh, to pick up Jonah and spit him out in Nineveh. Um, probably not a pleasant transaction for Jonah, uh, but one that the Lord has seen fit to record for us. Let's, uh, let's go through what we see as far as the book of Jonah. By way of introduction, it's named after its main character, Jonah, and his name means dove in Hebrew. Uh, so that's a fun name. Interesting uh, that Jonah's name is a symbol of peace uh, for us, generally speaking, but Jonah is the one it's the prophet who wants to see the judgment of the Lord uh, come. Um, Jonah would have prophesied around 760 BC. Uh, so that puts us, what's the next major event on the timeline of Israel's history after 760 BC? Yeah, the Assyrian captivity comes uh, one generation later. 38 years after this, so, so roughly 40 years following Jonah's ministry, uh, Assyria comes, and Jonah is a prophet in Israel under Jeroboam II. And you can look in 2 Kings chapter 14, if you like, and we see Jonah. I know after you did all of the hard work to find Jonah... 2 Kings 14, 25. During the reign of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, or excuse me, during the reign of Jeroboam II, uh, which is also during the uh, reign in Judah of Amaziah, Joash became, or king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart. Uh, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and he made Israel sin. Uh, he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the sea of, as far as the sea of Arabah. According to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant to Jonah, the son of, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. So these things all, uh, or this is part of, of Jonah's ministry. He is able to prophesy that uh, a good bit of Israel's land, the northern ten tribes, would be uh, restored to them. And Jonah is sent to Nineveh. In the book of Jonah, however, to prophesy to the Assyrians. Uh, now, a couple of important uh, things about that. First of all, uh, what were the Assyrians like? They were barbaric, to say the least. They were not nice people. Uh, their enemies, they would put on pikes coming into the capital city uh, of Nineveh. And so you would see that their enemies had been... Uh, decapitated and or just left on the pikes to slowly slide down and die. Uh, not a pleasant concept, but that's what they did. Uh, they were not nice people. Also, this is the people, remember, who have already been prophesied that they are the ones who are going to come and destroy Israel. So Jonah uh, does not have real pleasant thoughts, I'm certain, about the Assyrians, and particularly the Ninevites. Some of the major themes that we see in the book of Jonah, though, include uh, the sovereignty of God. 
God is sovereign. We see Jonah, especially in Jonah, especially that he is sovereign over the natural elements. Uh, Take a look at chapter 1, verse 4. What happens when Jonah gets on the ship that's headed to, uh, well, let's, let's give a general flow of the book. What happens? God comes to Jonah, and he tells Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh, and you tell the, the Ninevites that judgment is coming. And instead of getting up and going, Jonah gets up and goes down, and goes down to Joppa, and he is, or he's taking a, he's taking a, uh, a boat to Tarshish. He is trying to get, uh, get going the other direction, uh, totally the wrong way. Uh, God sends a storm against the boat, we're going to see, and the sailors figure out that it is uh, Jonah uh, who has brought this storm upon them. Uh, they throw Jonah into the sea after not really wanting to do so, uh, and then God sends a fish to swallow Jonah up and to take him back to land, to spit him out. Uh, Jonah goes then to Nineveh. He gets up and goes this time after God comes to him again. He preaches that judgment is coming upon the city. The Ninevites respond in repentance. And Jonah is angry because God is a merciful God. And he says, I knew this was what you were going to do. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And so... He goes up on a, city, on a hill outside of the city and he sits there for 40 days and watches and waits for God to bring judgment. While he's out there, he gets hot because Nineveh is not far from the desert and God causes, again, we see the theme of, of God's sovereignty over the natural elements. God causes a plant to grow up for, for Jonah in just, a, in just a short period of time to give him some shade and Jonah was happy. But then God, again, Sovereign over the natural elements sends a worm to eat the plant and the plant to die. And Jonah is mad. And God says, Jonah, why are you mad? What did you do to uh, make this plant grow, to, to foster it, its growth, to uh, make it grow up? And Jonah says, nothing. I'm just mad. And God says, why would you have me then destroy this city? You had compassion on the plant. Why would you not have compassion on the city where I have made all these people and all sorts of good things like that? So uh, we leave Jonah actually on the edge of Nineveh uh, sulking over the fact that God has not destroyed the city. But we have the sovereignty of God over and over and primarily demonstrated uh, in his uh, authority over the natural elements of the earth. He sends the storm, he sends the fish, he, sends, he causes the plant to grow, he sends the worm to eat the plant. All sorts of stuff here that God is doing with the natural world to demonstrate uh, his power and sovereignty uh, over, over the natural world. We also see that God's compassion comes to the fore in the book of Jonah uh, we think of, of course, God's compassion on the Ninevites, and that's very true. But he also has compassion on the soldier, or on the sailors. Excuse me. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6, the captain approached Jonah after the uh, sailors are, have tried to do everything they could to save the ship. The captain approached him and said, how is it that, you're, that you are sleeping? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. God is indeed concerned about the sailors, and we see in verse 15, so they pick up Jonah, they throw him into the sea, the sea stops its raging, and the men feared Yahweh greatly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So we see here, there seems as if they become worshipers of the Lord and and may very well experience salvation, uh, seeing the Lord's mercy on them. We also see that Jonah is the recipient of God's compassion. We see in chapter 2, verse 2, uh, this is Jonah praying uh, from the stomach of the fish. I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help in the depth of Sheol, and you heard my voice. God had compassion on Jonah as he cried out to the Lord and sent the fish to gobble him up. And we also see... uh, That in chapter 4, verse 6, the Lord appointed a plant to grow over Jonah, to be a shade over his head, and to deliver him from his discomfort. 
And Jonah was extremely happy uh, about the plant. So God shows compassion on Jonah as well. And obviously, uh, God's compassion is demonstrated on the Assyrians. Chapter 3, verse 10, when they saw When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, this is their response to Jonah's preaching, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. In chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, we see something of God's thinking in demonstrating compassion. He said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. You see, Jonah at a lot of times conducts himself very similarly to a little teenage little girl. Uh, And then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and which perished overnight. Should I not then have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? So we see God's compassion on the, on the Ninevites, on the Assyrians. We also see that God's compassion is the reason that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. You know, we think of uh, evangelists going around and you see someone saved, you see someone repent, and there's joy and there's gladness, not Jonah. He prayed to the Lord, this is after the Assyrians have repented. And after God has relented, it displeased, in chapter 4, verse 1, Jonah greatly. Uh, And he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Darn it, Lord, you're so compassionate, I didn't want to come here and prophesy to these people. Uh, That's essentially what Jonah told God. Um, So you have then the compassion of the Lord come to the fore. Also, Jonah's disobedience. And we see this uh, initially in particular. uh, When you read Jonah next time, Pay close attention to the words up and down. All right, pay close attention to the words up and down. Uh, They are used to demonstrate and to drive home uh, Jonah's disobedience to the Lord. Look what God says in chapter 1, verse 2. Arise. What does arise mean? It means get up, right? And go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, so he went down. He went down to Joppa to find a ship which was going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And then Jonah goes down to the bottom of the sea. Uh, So you have God tells Jonah to get up and go uh, and Jonah gets up and goes down. He goes exactly the opposite uh, direction from where the Lord sends him. We also see that his continued attitude is one of disobedience. Uh, He grumbles against the Lord. He is disappointed that God has brought uh, repentance to the Ninevites and that they have, uh, that God has relented concerning the calamity that he is going to bring upon the Ninevites so, uh, so, God, or so Jonah is disobedient, and that's obviously brought to the fore as well. Now, we see in the purpose of the book of Jonah, we see that while Israel was an ineffective servant, the sovereign Yahweh brought salvation to repentant Gentiles. So, we see God's mercy, God's uh, God's compassion on the Gentiles, even during the time of uh, Jewish salvation, even during that dispensation. But we see that that happens uh, despite the ineffective servant that Israel is. And I think uh, Jonah is not necessarily represent. Well, 
It certainly is an allegory where, Je- where Jonah is a one-to-one uh, illustration or meant to think of Jonah and Israel as the same, but Jonah certainly is an, an apt representative uh, of the way that Israel is uh, during that time period. Uh, for structure, you can take a look and see Jonah. Uh, the book breaks down into his first commission and his second commission. Um, and these things, uh, the events in the first call to Jonah and the second call to Jonah mirror each other to uh, some degree. Uh, God commissions Jonah in, in chapter 1 and in chapter 3. Jonah rejects in chapter 1. He accepts in chapter 3. Uh, the sovereign God reveals his power in chapter 4 and his plan in chapter 3. Uh, the sailors submit to the Lord and avert disaster in chapter 1. Uh, the Ninevites submit to the Lord and avert disaster in chapter 3. Uh, the Lord uses a fish to retrieve Jonah. Jonah prays, complaining that the Lord has saved Nineveh. Uh, and Jonah uh, prays, thanking the Lord for saving his life, and God uses the plant and a worm to teach Jonah a lesson. So, uh, you have a structure there. Basically, the book is broken up into two halves uh, that each demonstrate the, uh, or along with each commission, each call that goes out to Jonah. Any questions on the book of Jonah? All right. Just an observation. Like, like when he was waiting for the, to see what the Lord would do to, to Nineveh, mm-hmm. maybe he saw, you know, the fact that the Lord had planted a plant. Okay, this, this is good. God, God's got a plant for me. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Yeah, you, Jonah is, it's, I mean, if, <laughs> it's almost so ridiculous, it's funny. You know, I, I picture just Jonah with his arms crossed and stomping his feet and saying, I knew this was going to happen. I knew you were compassionate and gracious and, and God just, yeah, shaking his head at Jonah. All right, the book of Micah, maybe a little less, uh, maybe a little less well known than Jonah. So let's talk about Micah a little bit. Micah's name means "Who is like the Lord?" Who is like the Lord? In the date of the book of Micah, or date of of Micah's. Uh, Ministry is 735 to 690 B.C., so Micah is ministering uh, during the time when the northern ten tribes fall. He is roughly contemporary with Isaiah and Hosea, okay, if that gives you an idea. Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah, a bunch of those guys who have a on the end of their name, go together uh, time-wise. And he is a prophet of Judah, serving at the end of the divided kingdom and into the surviving kingdom, again like Isaiah, during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Okay, during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. All right. Micah's major themes include, first of all, the sin of Jacob. Uh, And both the north and the south are included in this group. You take a look, Micah chapter 1, verse 5. All this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel, 
What is, what is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high pa- place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So Micah ministers to the southern kingdom, but he includes both the north and the south uh, in, his, in his message. And what we see in the book of Micah is that the leaders are leading the people astray while expecting God's favor. The, the leaders are, are expecting that they are favored by the Lord uh, when in reality they're leading the people astray. You can take a look. You see that uh, Micah takes aim at the leaders. Take a look at chapter 2, verses, verse 7. It is being said, O house of Jacob, in the spirit, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to the one walking uprightly? Recently, my people have arisen as an enemy. You strip the robe off, uh, off the garment from unsuspecting passers-by, from those who return to war. The women of my people you evict, each one from her pleasant house. From her children you have uh, taken my splendor forever. Take a look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob, rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from their flesh and from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones and chop them up as for the pot and meat in the kettle. God levels judgment and levels uh, Levels judgment against the leaders of the people because they're taking advantage of the people. Uh, They're taking advantage of them and robbing them. Now hear this, uh, verse 9. You heads of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight, who who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price. Her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord saying, is not the Lord in our midst? You see, the the people are thinking, because we're Israel, because we're Judah, we're God's people and we are the leaders thereof, God must be in our favor. But we see their crooked uh, actions. Not only the leaders, but we also see in the last part of these verses, the prophets. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to bite with their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. So these people have come, these false prophets have come and said, uh, if you give us something to eat, then we'll give you a good prophecy. We'll, We'll declare peace. But if you don't line our pockets, if you don't give us something to eat, uh, then we will pronounce judgment against you. We also see the priests here. Uh, We read uh, that the priests, the leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe in verse 11. Her priests instruct for a price. The prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord, saying, is not the Lord in our midst? Again, they expect God's favor. Uh, despite their corruption and their wickedness. Micah also points out that the totality of the nation is in rebellion uh, against the Lord as well. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Woe is me, for I am ruined like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land. There is no upright person among men. All of them lie and wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also like the judge for a bribe, and a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar. (laughs) The most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchman, your punishment will come, then their confusion will occur. Do not trust a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. From her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips, for son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against her mother, daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. A man's enemies are now the men of his own household. 
Micah looks around him and he sees wickedness and the rebellion of the people. But Micah also looks for the coming ruler. Micah looks for the coming ruler who will set all these things straight. We see that he will rule one day over the whole nation. Chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Micah says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like the flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes on before them, and the Lord at their head. So we see something of the nature of the king who will, be, who will reunite both northern and southern kingdoms and rule over them. He will be the Lord. And this one who is the coming king will also be the deliverer of the people. Chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler from in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor is born a child, and the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and he will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This is the one, this one will be our peace. When the Assyrian invades our land, when he tramples on our citadels, when they will raise again, then we will raise, a, excuse me, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. They will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he will deliver us from the Assyrian when he attacks our land. And when he tramples our territory. So this is the, uh, the passage in the prophets that tells us where the Messiah will be born. And looks forward ultimately when the Messiah will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And will subdue the nations who are enemies of Israel. The purpose of the book of Micah. Micah demonstrates or states that the righteous Yahweh will judge his unrighteous people. But the coming ruler will fulfill the Lord's promise to David and to Abraham. Micah looks around himself and sees the wickedness and cries out against that wickedness, the wickedness and corruption that he sees in the nation Israel. Uh, but he also recognizes that the coming ruler, or the ruler will come, the Messiah will come, he will rule and fulfill God's promises to David and to Abraham. You can take a look here at the structure. Uh, breaks down at chapter between chapters two and three, and then between chapters, excuse me, four and six are the major breaks. There you have the introduction to the book of Micah, where he identifies when he prophesies in chapter one, verse one. But uh, the Lord's judgment of Israel and Judah, uh, God's judgment in chapters three, four, and five on the leaders, and the Lord's indictment of the people then. Uh, and each of these sections has a section that outlines judgment, but also looks forward to the restoration that the Lord will bring to the people. So it's, he makes a case against the people. Uh, and the individual in the righteous remnant we see in chapter 7, uh, the, the remnant of the, of the righteous individual will recognize that blessing is coming. Uh, through the Lord, so. All right. That's Micah. Let's also take a look then at Nahum. Let's take a look at the book of Nahum. Now we saw in Jonah 
that in the early 600s BC, God sent, or what? Not the early 600s BC. Would have been the early 700s. What's that? Yeah, sorry. In, in the early 700s, mid, early to mid 700s BC, God sent Jonah to the Assyrians to warn them of the judgment that was coming, and the Assyrians repented. Now, Jonah was upset about that because he didn't want the people to repent and for God to relent concerning the calamity that he was going to bring upon them. I think... I think that uh, Jonah would much rather have been Nahum. <laughs> because Na- Nahum comes to the Assyrians, goes to Nineveh, and tells them that God is going to judge them. He tells them God is going to judge the Assyrians. Uh, Interestingly enough, Nahum's name means comfort. Uh, Nahum's name means comfort. He did not bring comfort to the Assyrians. But Nahum prophesies to the Assyrians in 663 to 654 BC. That's about the uh, date of his ministry. He is sent to the Assyrians at Nineveh after they had conquered and destroyed Israel, the northern ten tribes. So we are 80 years later probably two generations after this. And this is during the reign, maybe not quite that far. It wouldn't be that far. Uh, 20 and 60, 40. Help me out. 40, 50, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, So you've got a little bit of time now after uh, the fall of Israel. Uh, Obviously, the Nahum minister's Uh, In general, he's part of the surviving kingdom, Judah, and he, this happens, Nahum's prophecy happens during the reign of the Messiah, or excuse me, the reign of Manasseh, not the Messiah, during the reign of Manasseh in Judah, and Nahum is the first of the prophets during the surviving kingdom. So the first of the prophets who, who ministers solely after the fall of the northern kingdom and before the fall of the southern kingdom. Now, what, what are things like in Israel during Manasseh's day? Uh, or excuse me, in Judah, they're not good, right? Remember, Manasseh is the king uh, that seals Judah's fate, uh, so to speak. He seals Judah's fate. God is going to judge them uh, after, after Manasseh. Some of the major themes in uh, Nahum... Include uh, Nineveh, which is where he gives this prophecy. You see that at the very beginning of the book. The oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. Now in Jonah, Nineveh is spared, remember, because of God's compassion at her repentance. In Micah, remember... God is going to use, in Micah we see that God is going to use Nineveh to judge Israel, and we also see that Nineveh's judgment is the guarantee of the coming ruler. What did we see that God was going to do uh, when the Messiah came? He was going to, what's that? Yeah, beat back the Assyrians, right? And so this is ultimately... Uh, guarantee the judgment that God brings on Israel at the hands of Nineveh is guarantee that God is going to bring the coming ruler, uh, the Messiah. And now in Nahum, we see that Nineveh is going to suffer judgment because of her wickedness. We see that Nineveh will suffer God's judgment because of her wickedness. And in many ways... Uh, Nineveh is a picture of what God is going to do with the rest of the uh, with the rest of the nations. We see that God is going to judge the nations first and foremost because of His character. 
Watch how, watch how Nahum starts. Uh, Nahum chapter 1 verse 2, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is his way and the clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of, the Lebanon, of Lebanon wither. The mountains quake because of him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence and the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, but an overflowing flood he will make, but, but with an overflowing flood he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. We see that it is part of the character of the Lord to avenge those who have done what is wrong. We also see in chapter 3 that there are none who are exempt. Chapter 3, verse 8. He says, you are no, no better. Talking to Nineveh, to Nineveh here. You are no better than no Amon, uh, which was situated by the waters of the Nile with the water surrounding her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall consisted of the sea. Or are you better than, excuse me, are you better than no Ammon? Ethiopia was her might and Egypt too without limits. Put and Libum were among her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity also. Her small children were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They, cost, they cast lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound with fetters. He says, you too will become drunk. You will be hidden. You too will search for a refuge from the enemy. All your fortifications uh, are fig trees with ripe fruit. When shaken, they will fall into the eater's mouth. So you see here, God simply lines up and said that my character is to judge those who do wrong and that not even the greatest city, not even the greatest people, the greatest nation on all the earth here are the Assyrians. He said, not even you are exempt from the judgment that will come by my hand. The purpose of the book it's to demonstrate or to forewarn that Yahweh would judge Nineveh for its cruel and immoral deeds. It's as simple as that. God is going to judge the Assyrians. In the structure, you can see Nahum down here. The init, God, after the introduction, God outlines his character, his nature. Uh, he outlines the destruction that he's going to bring upon Nineveh. And then there is a lament that is sung for Nineveh. And its fall. Boy, we are flying through these, aren't we? That brings us to Habakkuk. Yes. Let me look it up. I'll find it right now. It is not long after this. Um, Six twelve. Mm hmm. Six twelve is when uh, um, Nabopolassar. Uh, and the Babylonians conquer, conquer Nineveh. 586 is when, yep, and that's under Nebuchadnezzar. So um, if you remember your order of the kingdoms, you have Assyria and then Babylon and then the, the Medo-Persian Empire. The Babylonians um, under Nabopolassar are able to in a, Confederation and the 
they make friends with uh, the Medes. <clears throat> Remember, the Persians don't rise until later, actually until the time when they, uh, until the same ruler, Cyrus the Great, uh, when they conquer Babylon. That's, the Persians aren't the major power there, the Medes are. And so the Medes and the Babylonians, and then a couple of the, a couple of the tribes to the north there, northeast of Asia Minor, uh, they're able to rise against, against Nineveh and uh, the Assyrians and wipe the Assyrians out. The Assyrians never become a major player again uh, after that conquest. So, and then that's under the leadership of Nabopolassar um, with the Babylonians. Nabopolassar is, is Nebuchadnezzar's father. And then Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nabopolassar dies actually while Nebuchadnezzar is um, in and around Israel. He has to go back, uh, secure his position there in, uh, there in Babylon. Because um, it was pretty rare that you just had everybody go, oh, okay, well, he's the king's son, so he's going to be the king now. Everybody tried to get a piece of that action. And so... Nebuchadnezzar had to go back, and then uh, that's at the time of, or shortly after the first uh, deportation. And then, <clears throat> so right around 605 BC. And then uh, 586, uh, the, Jews, the Jews keep trying to ally, ally themselves with Egypt. And uh, the, the Babylonians are trying to get into Egypt. Try and conquer, trying to conquer Egypt. And so Nebuchadnezzar eventually says, I've had enough of this, and wipes Israel out, wipes Jerusalem out. Good segue uh, into the book of Habakkuk, because Habakkuk has to do with the Babylonians. Habakkuk has to do with the Babylonians. And Habakkuk's name means one who embraces. And he's going to have some difficult questions to ask the Lord. Uh, and uh, he's going to embrace the answers that he gets, even though they're difficult. Now Habakkuk writes, uh, ministers 608 to 598, excuse me, to 598 BC. Let's see if we can get through Habakkuk here while I have the hiccups. <laughs> Habakkuk ministers to the remaining kingdom of Judah uh, during the time of Jehoiakim. So, remember, I, and I just said the date, what, what year does Nebuchadnezzar first make his way into Israel? When's the first deportation? 605. Okay, so 605 B.C., is the first deportation, and who goes, who's taken during the first deportation? The rich, the rich talented, smart, good-looking people. Uh, they take the important people back to Babylon. Uh, this is probably when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those guys are young, so they're taken, uh, they're taken away. So Habakkuk would have been uh, an older contemporary of some of those guys, some people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, their ministries wouldn't necessarily have overlapped, but uh, they would have been alive at about the same time. Um, so we are in Judah's final days as we uh, move through Habakkuk. We're in Judah's final days leading up to the Babylonian invasions. Now, Habakkuk lays out in a series of questions. Uh, the first part of it does. Habakkuk notices that uh, Judah is wicked. And his question is, how long, O Lord, are you going to allow this to go on? How long before you bring an end to all of these things? And God answers Habakkuk and he says, not too long. Because in not very long, I'm bringing the Babylonians uh, against the nation of Judah. And that is not the answer that Habakkuk was looking for. 
<laughs> Habakkuk said, wow, um, you realize that the Babylonians are even more wicked than the Judeans are, right? Uh, so he says, how does that work? And God says, my ways are greater than yours. Uh, I know what I'm doing. And a good portion of the book of Habakkuk is Habakkuk coming to grips with that and making petition, praise, and promise in chapter 3. And what we see is that the righteous man uh, must be patient and trust in the Lord in his time of judgment. Must be patient and trust the Lord in the time of his judgment. Some of the major themes that we see include the ways of God. And one of the major things that we see about the ways of God are that they are incomprehensible. Or as the Sicilian uh, might say, inconceivable. But look at chapter 1, verse 5. Look among the nations and observe. Be astonished and wonder because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. You see, at this point, Habakkuk is asked the question in chapter 1, verse 2, How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous and therefore justice comes out perverted. You see Habakkuk's plight. He looks around himself, sees all the wicked, sees that the good are trampled on during this time of wickedness, and he says, how long are you going to let this go on? And God says, you wouldn't believe what I'm going to do if I told you. All right, he says, look out. Watch, observe, be astonished, and wonder, because I am doing something in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. And you'll note the character of these people. They're fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize the dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses swifter than leopards, keener than the wolves in the evening. He goes on and he continues to uh, describe them. And Habakkuk asks this question. In chapter 1, verse 12, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will, not we will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those who are more righteous than they? Why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook and drag them away in their net and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net because, though these things, because through these things their catch is large and their food is plentiful. They will therefore empty their net and continually slay. Will they therefore... Empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing. I will stand my guard. I will stand on my guard post to station and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me, how I may reply when I am reproved. So Habakkuk here says exactly that. He says, "I can't believe that you are. You're right, God. You said I couldn't believe it, or I wouldn't believe it if you told me what you were doing, and I." I have a hard time understanding this. We also see that included in the ways of God are both wrath and mercy. Chapter 3, verse 2 says, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk's prayer is that when God judges the nation Israel in his wrath, Judah here, I suppose, more particularly, uh, that he remember mercy. And that is in keeping with his character. 
Uh, The righteous are also a major theme in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, You have a righteous man speaking with a righteous God. Look at Look at the evaluation of Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 4. Therefore the law is ignored, justice is never upheld. The wicked surround the righteous and therefore justice comes out perverted. And he understands that he is talking to the righteous God. We said or we saw that uh, Habakkuk freely acknowledges this in chapter 1 verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. So you have a righteous man speaking to the righteous God. So the righteous are key in Habakkuk's thinking. And we see that ultimately righteousness comes through faith. And this is the source of the quote that we see so often in the New Testament. That the righteous man shall live by faith. Chapter 2, chapter four, two verse 4. Excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. So we see that Habakkuk, there's a fascinating give and take uh, in the book of Habakkuk between Habakkuk and the Lord. Uh, I think there is a beautiful picture of the way that a righteous man ought to interact with God when he has questions about what's going on. We see that Habakkuk questions God. He asks him, What are you, what's happening? I, he, he comes to God and says, I don't understand what's going on. And God enlightens him to some degree. He tells him that, uh, he tells him that I'm doing something here, that I have plans for, what are, for what's going on here. Uh, but they're not plans that you're necessarily going to understand. And the response of Habakkuk is key. What does Habakkuk do? He trusts the Lord. He says, I don't understand what's happening here. I don't understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. But I trust that you are God who will, and you will do right. I trust that you are God and that you will do right. Yeah. Well, you can add it. Oh, yeah, sorry, righteous and faith there. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, So what we see in the book of Habakkuk really is the righteous man will live by faith as Yahweh brings his judgment and the righteous man awaits his ultimate salvation. Those who are righteous will live by faith as God brings his judgment and while, and they'll live by faith while they await their ultimate salvation. And again, you can see uh, in the structure at the top of the next page in your charts that uh, Habakkuk, uh, after the introduction, Habakkuk asks his questions. God responds to his questions. And that Habakkuk uh, ends the book in a prayer of petition and praise. And looking toward uh, the promise that will come to his people. So the book of Habakkuk is, it's a, it's a gem. It is fascinating. Uh, and I, I appreciate it greatly. Um, not that all of the books of the Bible aren't gems. But uh, that's, a hidden, that's a hidden gem. Uh, it is, it'll preach, yep. In fact, a couple of years ago, uh, I remember a preacher visited and preached through the book of Habakkuk in, between the mor- morning and evening, uh, between the morning and evening services, and and uh, did a fine job with it. All right, it's the top of the hour. Let's uh, let's break here. And let's see if we can't get through the rest of the prophets here uh, this afternoon. And if not, then that's fine too. All right, as we continue our trek through the the little guys, the book of the twelve, we come to Zephaniah. Come to Zephaniah.
And we see with Zephaniah, his name means the Lord hides. Uh, Zephaniah's ministry was in the 630s B.C. And interestingly enough, Zephaniah is, apparent, is part of the royal family. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of uh, Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of King Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So you see here, he is part of the, the royal family. You'll recognize a lot of those names there from, excuse me, Kings and Chronicles. His ministry is to Judah, obviously, where after the fall of the northern king or kingdom in, in Israel. His ministry is to Judah during Josiah's reign, and Zephaniah probably played a major role in the reforms of Josiah's reign. You remember what's characteristic of, of Josiah. He obeys the Lord more than any of the other kings, right? Uh, the, the law is gone. They don't have any copies of it, or they apparently have very few copies of it in the land when Josiah comes to rule. Uh, this is shortly after the rule of Manasseh. And uh, Josiah sees the temple in disrepair, and so he decides to, uh, to remodel, I guess you might say. He decides to, uh, to repair uh, the, the, the temple as it's in disrepair. And they find the scroll of the law, and he reads it, and he goes, whoa, we're not doing any of this stuff. And so it says that in Josiah's reign, they celebrated a Passover like's never been, like had never been uh, celebrated before or since. So you have the ministry of Zephaniah probably taking place uh, within those reforms. Some of the major themes we see... Uh, the day of the Lord is a major theme in the book of Zephaniah, and that not that it hasn't been uh, for, for most of the minor prophets, but Zephaniah brings out a couple of different things about the day of the Lord. Uh, most specifically, though, it's nearness. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near, the day of uh, for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and he has consecrated its guest. Down in verse 14, near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming quickly. Listen in the day of the Lord and in it the warrior cries out. We see there, we, we read this when we looked at the introduction, our introduction to the book of the 12. Uh, but Zephaniah explains in some detail what the nature of the day of the Lord is going to be like. We've been talking about that on Sunday mornings as well as Gil has gone through and he's mentioned uh, that the day of the Lord ultimately looks forward to that 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation between the rapture and the coming of Christ to the earth. And we see that this is going to be a day of wrath, a day of trouble, a day of distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. It says, I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord, their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy for he will make a complete end and indeed a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. So you see that the day of the Lord is not going to be a pleasant time. Uh, and it is one that is imminent that the people ought to be looking out for. Uh, Zephaniah also looks forward to the restoration of the nation Israel. Uh, you can look at chapter 3. Really, the book ends with a description of what Israel will be like in those days. You can pick up in verse 14, shout for joy, O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies, the King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion, do not let your hands fall limp, for the Lord your God is in your midst. A victorious warrior, he will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. 
I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. And they came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At, the t- at that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So, he looks forward to the deliverance that will come after the day of the Lord for the people of Israel. Uh, the purpose, we see Yahweh's control over all the nations will be proven in the near day of the Lord. And by way of structure, again, you can just look the coming of the day of the Lord and the coming judgment and blessing uh, of the oppressing city. Zephaniah is pretty quick. Uh, that leads us to Haggai. Haggai. Yes. Um, do we know where most of the prophets came from for the tribes? Were any of them Levites or Um, I'm trying to think. Obviously, uh, Zephaniah would have been part of the uh, Judean tribe. Uh, I don't think so. I think he's at the temple. Um, you know, I'd have to look for individual ones. There are a few that you could, I suppose, deduce the tribe that they're from. Um, but only insofar as it's important. Uh, a lot of times we don't have a lot of biographical information uh, about, about the prophets. Again, what they give us and maybe what we see from... Um, from kings, you know, somebody like Jonah, uh, where we get his father and maybe we could, you know, maybe we could make a guess sometimes. Uh, but by and large, by and large, we don't know a ton about them biographically. All right. Brings us to Haggai. We might actually get through the Minor Prophets today. It'll be exciting. By the way, with Zephaniah, we have within the 12, the end of the pre-exile prophets. So Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are all post-exilic. And you'll remember Haggai uh, is one of the prophets that the Lord sends to the people when the work on the temple has stopped. All right, the work on the temple stops for a fairly long period of time, and Haggai is sent uh, along with Malachi, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, contemporaries of each other. Uh, But these guys are sent to encourage the people to resume their work on the temple. Uh, Haggai's name means the festal one. Haggai writes in 520 BC, this prophecy, this oracle is given in 520 BC, the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month. So we have uh, the very date on which Haggai brings this first prophecy and several prophecies that follow. August 29th, uh, 520 B.C., uh, September 21st, 520 B.C. is when he gives the second oracle, October 17th, uh, the third oracle, December 18th, uh, are both the fourth and fifth oracle. You can see there Haggai under your, uh, on your charts is broken into five different oracles. Uh, or five different sections that start on different dates. Uh, He is the first of the post-exilic prophets in the 12. Uh, Remember, the rebuilding of the temple had been halted for 15 years 
because of opposition from local kings and authorities. You can look, excuse me, look at Ezra chapter 4 in verse 23. Then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' document, document was read before Rahum and Shimshai, the scribe and their colleagues went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. So what's happened is, remember in the book of Ezra, the Persians have sent the Jews back into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Now if you are one of the people who has filled the power gap, the power vacuum, uh, that was created by the Jews being taken out of Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem being destroyed, you're not going to be real thrilled about the people coming back, the Jews coming back into Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple, which was the center of their worship and their culture and everything. So they hear that Artaxerxes has, uh, or they hear that, uh, excuse me, they hear that uh, the, the work has been brought or has been started to rebuild the temple. Uh, they start sending letters of correspondence to other uh, people up the, up the ladder, up the political ladder uh, in, uh, what would it be, the, in Persia now uh, with the Persians. And there's some legal debate over whether or not this can continue. Uh, there's opposition here. Uh, eventually, the Jews are able to um, get permission to restart, uh, and Haggai and Zechariah intervene with Zerubbabel to resume construction uh, 15 years after, it had, been, after it, had, it had been halted. Sounds like some construction projects today, right? <laughs> Delays and, <laughs> yeah, especially where politics are involved. That's very true. Very true. The temple was eventually completed. The people re restarted their work. And the temple in, uh, in 520, the temple was eventually completed on March 12th in 515. And we see that in Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. So Haggai and Zechariah are able to uh, get the people uh, marshaled back into their work and uh, work on the, um, excuse me, work on the temple resumes and it's completed a little less than five years later. Some of the major themes, obviously the temple is key here and particularly we see at the beginning that the temple is complete. Look at chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, in verse 4, while this house lies desolate? The people have, uh, in this 15-year gap between the beginning of the construction of the temple and the resumption of the construction of the temple, they've made themselves comfortable in the land. They've come back into the land. They have built paneled houses. The idea is that they have built substantial houses and they have put time and resources and, and money and effort and all sorts of things into their own houses and they've left the house of the Lord desolate. We also see that God through Haggai challenged the peop, challenges the people and says, you're lacking because of this. He says in chapter 1, verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts, because my house which lies desolate, while each of, because my house lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. So God says, look, I'm withholding blessing from you because you are not uh, doing what you ought to do, because you are not being obedient uh, in this area. And we see that the people are obedient. Uh, 
Construction resumes, chapter 1, verse 14. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. So unlike most politicians today, they're able to get things moving. Uh, but that's because the Lord moves the heart of the people. And there is a new glory here in spite of its appearance. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. Who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? You'll remember that when the people, uh, we see in, in uh, Ezra, that when the people who had seen the Old Testament, or seen the Old uh, temple saw the completion of the new temple they wept because it was nothing in comparison to what Solomon's temple had been like uh, God says God says take courage in this and that there is glory here uh, chapter 2 verse 7 I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations and I will fill the house with my glory says the Lord of hosts the latter glory, verse 9, of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in its place, I shall give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And the people's work on the, uh, the, people's work on the, ho- on the house of the Lord, on the temple, and their completion of it results in blessings. I love it. God says, God challenges the people in chapter 1. He says, look, do what you know you're supposed to do. Uh, be obedient and see if I will and see if I will bless you. And they are obedient, and he does bring blessing. Look at chapter two, verse fifteen. But but now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on the other in the temple of the Lord, from that time when one came to grain to a grain heap of twenty measures, there would only be ten. And when one came with one, uh, to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there would only be 20. I smote you in every work of your hands with, uh, with blasting wind, with mildew and hail. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do not consider from this day, or do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, uh, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. Is the seed still in the barn, even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, uh, and the olive tree? It has not borne fruit, yet from this day I will bless you. Uh, So God says, I'm going to bring blessing, uh, the blessing of the land. And that's in keeping with the law, right? What did God say? How how was the Mosaic law set up with with the nation Israel? If you obey, I'll bring blessing. If you disobey, I'll bring curse. And God functions in light of that and in keeping with that uh, promise. The call to consider, we've seen that here a couple of times. Uh, but you'll see that that's a, that's a resounding call in the book of Haggai, the, the call to consider. The purpose of the book is to ch- present the challenge uh, to the leaders and to the people to rebuild the temple. And you can see the structure there uh, again um, on your charts. So Haggai... Zechariah, let's consider Zechariah quickly and see if we can get through Malachi too. Zechariah's name means the Lord remembers. And we're going to see that that is appropriate because God is going to remember the nation Israel. It's funny to me to think about how often the name of the prophet matches the message that God is going to send him with. And you even see God's sovereign hand in parents picking a name (laughs) <laughs> for their children. Oops, that was not what's supposed to happen. Uh, Zechariah uh, ministers alongside of Haggai. We see his, his ministry and the uh, oracles that we see in the book of Zechariah probably take place sometime between 520 and 480 B.C. So you're coming very close to the end of the Old Testament era. He ministered in conjunction, like I said, with Haggai. You can see their names together in Ezra chapter 4 and Ezra chapter 6. Uh, and Zechariah 
sticks on the scene and continues to encourage the people to keep working on the temple. Sometimes it's good to have someone stay there and encourage. Uh, And Zechariah does exactly that. Some of the major themes uh, include uh, the Lord of hosts, the concept of the Lord of hosts. Now, if you stop and think about what that means, that means that he is the uh, controller, the, the captain of the armies of heaven. And now that's an important concept uh, for Zechariah because the people at this point are not in a strong position strategically in particular, right? They are in a city that doesn't yet have its walls. And they're under the threat of violence as they continue work on the temple. Uh, Again, the local crime lords or whatever you want to call them uh, are not real happy about the fact that the people are back in the land, that the Jews are back in the land. And there is threat of violence. And Zechariah... And his oracles on a regular basis reminds the people that Yahweh is the Lord of hosts. He is the one who controls the armies of heaven. He's the one who controls the armies of heaven. Uh, He points out and reminds the people that there is a need uh, for repentance. Zechariah encourages the people of Judah or Israel now who are rebuilding the temple, rebuilding Uh, the city of Jerusalem, to turn aside from the sins that the previous generations committed. Uh, We'll just look at, uh, we'll look at chapter 2 verses 1, or chapter 1 verses 2 through 6. The Lord was very angry with your fathers. So what's the logical conclusion going to be? Don't be like your fathers. Therefore, Say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, return now, or, return now from your evil ways, from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said, as the Lord has proposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. (laughs) Zechariah opens his message with, hey, what happened to your fathers when they were disobedient? They, They got it, right? God brought judgment. And the prophets warned them that judgment was coming and they continued on in their, in their rebellion against the Lord, against the Lord of hosts, and God's judgment overtook them. So the point there is clearly, <laughs> don't be like your fathers. Don't commit the sins that they committed. Turn from the sins of the previous generations. We also see a number of different uh, themes here that we won't take too much time to to. Uh, expound upon. God is in control of the nations. He is going to bring them ultimately to judgment. Uh, Ultimately, though, Zechariah looks forward to God's future restoration of Israel and the coming shepherd and king, the coming shepherd king and priest. Shepherd, king, and priest. Uh, We have a great deal, actually, about what will happen uh, at the second coming of Christ, uh, revealed to us at the end of the book of Zechariah. It is where we understand that when Christ returns, he'll come down and he'll set foot down on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Remember, in the book of Revelation, this is happening as the battle of Armageddon happens, as the city of Jerusalem is being attacked. And part of what will happen is the, the, the earth will split, and it will give... Uh, Jerusalem time to escape and the Lord will make war uh, with the nations as he comes down from the Mount of Olives and brings judgment uh, in that campaign. Uh, So we see a great deal about the second coming uh, of the Lord in the book of Zechariah. The purpose of the book, God remembers the nation of Israel and will yet bring 
messianic blessing upon it. He points us toward uh, what that will look like. And you can see uh, the structure of the book of Zechariah uh, in your charts. There's a call to repentance uh, early on as we saw. Uh, Zechariah sees eight night visions in chapters 1 through 6. We see the issue of fasting in chapters 7 and 8. And two burdens, the rejection of the Messiah and the acceptance of the Messiah um, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, and then in chapters 12, 13. Zechariah has 14 chapters, right? Yeah, 12, 13, and 14. So there's the book of Zechariah. And now we come to the book of Malachi. Zechariah was the Lord remembers. Now we have Malachi. Malachi's name means my messenger. My messenger. And Malachi probably writes, uh, ministers and writes sometime between 450 and 430 BC. He would have been among the last writers of the Old Testament. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets. It's possible that uh, first and second chronicles was written after Malachi, but it's going to be close. Um, And what we see, so we're what? We're not a hundred years after Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, Maybe barely a full generation later. And we see already that the people have lapsed into unfaithfulness. Malachi is a depressing end to the Old Testament. Uh, As a whole book, we see hope at the very end of Malachi, but it's something of a depressing end. Because there's all sorts of hope, right? You think of the people during uh, during uh, oh, come on, Ezra and Nehemiah, and their obedience and the godly leadership that's there with Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Zerubbabel, these guys, Joshua. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, But then we come to Malachi and we find that it hasn't taken long for the people to uh, display their sinfulness. The people have lapsed into unfaithfulness and Malachi's call is for the people to repent. And remember, what did Zechariah just get done telling the people? Don't fall into the same sins of your fathers, right? Don't do what your fathers did. God was angry with them, and look what happened. The words of the prophets, uh, the words that God sent uh, with the prophets, they caught up with them, and they were judged. uh, But the people don't listen, not for very long anyway. The major themes of the book of Malachi, first and foremost, are the sins of Israel. One of the things you see here, this, this is amazing. They profane the temple by bringing unacceptable sacrifice. Look what they do. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where's my honor? And if I am a master, where's my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for the sacrifice, is it not evil? When you present the lame or the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? How about that? 
The people have brought blind and lame and sick animals to, to offer as sacrifices. And God has said, you'll bring the best of your flock. You'll bring the ones without defect, without impurity. And God says, how about if you try and offer these animals to your governor as taxes? How's that going to go over? You offer him the sheep that are uh, worthless sheep that are blind and have defects. He says, that wouldn't, work with your, that wouldn't work with your governor. Why would it work with your God? We also see that they profane the temple by bringing uh, unacceptable marriage. The people have very specific instructions. The nation Israel is to marry within the nation. And we see that they have done exactly the opposite. Do we all have one father? Chapter 2, verse 10. Has not God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who, await, who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? This is a consistent pattern of how, of how Malachi is built. God brings a charge against the people. The people say, how have we, how have we done this? And God answers he says, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, although she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what, what did that one do while he was seeking godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And him who covers the garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts, so take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. They have profaned the temple by bringing unacceptable sacrifice. They have profaned the temple by bringing unacceptable marriage. And they have profaned the temple by bringing unacceptable offering. Chapter 3, verses 7 to 12, God again brings these charges against the people. For the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with the curse for the robbing of me by the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, this is like uh, Malachi, right? Or not Malachi, uh, Haggai. Haggai says, look, you, you come to draw wine from the vat and there's not enough there. You come to draw grain from the storehouse and there's not enough there because you're being disobedient. And God says, look, bring the whole tithe that you're supposed to bring. Bring what you're supposed to bring to the temple and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you may not destroy the fruits of the ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. They brought an unacceptable offering. We won't take the time here, but they have spoken wicked words as well. Your words have been arrogant against me. You see there at the very beginning of the next verse in chapter 3. He brings the sins of Israel before them, and he says, like all the others have, that judgment is coming, and then God will bless. Through the ministry first of his messenger, and through the Lord's judgment. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day is coming, the day that is coming will be set will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will not leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You will go forth and skip like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. 
Our purpose here is that Israel is called to repentant, or repentance and covenant faithfulness. Again, they followed in the sins of their fathers and their fathers before them. You can see uh, there in the, on your charts the structure of Malachi. Uh, six disputations. God brings uh, six accusations against the people of Israel. Uh, the people of Israel say, how have we done this? And God outlines before them, here's, here's what's gone on. It's, it's as if God brings a, a court case uh, against the nation Israel, against uh, the Judeans here, and uh, calls them to repentance. You can see the, the, uh, the cycle there as well. Uh, and then there's the appendix at the very end. He leaves us with the reminder that Elijah is coming again, and Elijah will come before the Lord comes. And so, Interesting that the Old Testament, in our arrangement in particular, leaves off with this, because what's the very first thing that you're going to hear in the New Testament? The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, make way the, the, the path of the Lord. So, we see John the Baptist is going to come. He could have, been, he could have filled the ministry of Elijah had the people accepted, uh, accepted his message and turned to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Everybody has their own version of what's right. Reminds me of Judges, too. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. So that's the book of the Twelve, the Minor Prophets. We've taken a look, a run, really, through the prophets here, the first half of our class together. Uh, what we're looking at from here on out is, uh, is the uh, remainder of the writings. So the stuff that we didn't catch, um, the stuff that we didn't catch with the, uh, with the historical narrative sections. Um, so we'll, move our, we'll work our way through those. Um, what I'm thinking... Uh, is probably, even if we finish up the Old Testament stuff before men's retreat, uh, I want one of our, I'll, I'll, we'll have, we'll take a couple weeks of break here at the end of February and maybe at the beginning of March. Um, I have to look and see though if, I, I do want to give you guys the week of, of men's retreat off for sure, uh, just for the fullness of that weekend. Um, so even if we finish up the Old Testament stuff here before, uh, we may just go right into the New Testament and then take our break over those couple of weeks. Um, but just so you guys can plan ahead, uh, probably the weeks will be the 23rd and then the 2nd of March when we'll, be, when we'll have off. So plan on that tentatively, and we'll confirm that as we come closer. And if we finish out the Old Testament before that, we'll just jump, we'll just jump straight to some of the New Testament stuff. So I assume you guys are all planning on continuing on into the, into the New Testament. So uh, good deal. Uh, we'll see you guys next week.